Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. For those of you that have been interested in going to the Progressive Hoof Care Practitioners 2022 conference in Denver, Colorado, the early bird registration has been extended until August 14th, 2022. There will be all kinds of sessions, talks, demonstrations, a trade show all around hoof care and soundness with some of the most amazing presenters and practitioners from around the country and the world. You can learn more about it at progressivehoofcare.org slash conference, and I hope to see you there. So I will regularly get messages and emails suggesting various guests for the podcast. And one name that kept coming up was Celeste Leilani Lazarus. And so finally, I decided to kind of investigate who this person was a little bit more. And I realized that her work was super interesting. Something I found especially interesting that I saw that she was doing was focusing on building better balance through movement and training and looking at things like the thoracic sling and nerve impingement and how that affects a horse's soundness. Of course, as a hoof care provider, I'm always looking for other ways to ensure that a horse is comfortable and ensure that their feet are going to be the healthiest they can be. So I reached out to Celeste to see if she could help me put together some pieces of the puzzle. All right. So first, I would love to talk about how you got into this functional anatomy type approach to rehab. Yeah, definitely. Um a little bit of like a roundabout story. I was a competitive horse rider and trainer for years and years and years. And, you know, where I grew up, body work wasn't a thing. Um, I didn't even get massage therapy myself. So I had, I had no real, I guess, awareness or appreciation for body work. And I was specifically known for taking on problem cases, dangerous horses, things like that. And there was a body worker that came through a barn that I was training at and she knew that about me. And she was like, Hey, I'd love to work on some of your horses. And I was like, eh, you know, like, I don't even get massages. What is this like woo thing? You know? Um, and she was like, just give me a shot. I know, I know the kind of cases that you work on. I really think that I could help you bring me out your toughest case that you have in right now. I won't charge you. I just want you to, you know, let, let the horse speak for itself kind of a thing. I'm like, okay, fine. Whatever. I'm not out any money. And so I bring out this horse, she works on him. And the next day, like the majority of his problems had gone away. Wow. And yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I was in my twenties and a little bit, you know, still kind of a, a dumb skeptic and was like, Oh, you know, maybe all of my training is paid off today. Or, you know what I mean? Like I'm trying to like mull over these different ideas in my head where I'm like, surely it's not just that, but maybe. And so the next time she came out, I was like, all right, well, we'll see. I'm going to, I'm going to throw a few horses at her and I'll pay for it this time. So it's not a trial, but you know, whatever. And so she works on all the ones that I bring out and the same thing happened. And, you know, it, it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, well, you know, I can't, you're, you can't, you can't argue that at this point. So I mean, I really couldn't have argued it the first time around. I was just trying to be stubborn, but so I was like, okay, well, there's obviously something here. And so I talked to her for quite a while and, you know, kind of went through my own process and decided that I was just going to hire her as a, like it, just an influential part of my team. And so from here on out, every horse got, got, came, that came in had to be worked on by her first and they didn't get started with anything until they had a full set of body work. And then that way I could get a really clear idea of what was pain, what was behavior, what was this, what was that. And so that worked out for a while. Um, and it was really, really awesome. The results were way faster. I had lots of happy clients, lots of happy horses. And then over time, it just made sense for me to start learning how to do it on my own. And so I hadn't gone to school for it yet. I just learned with her and, and just kind of practiced. And what was really interesting for me was when you, it's one thing to have somebody else work on your horses and it's, you know, and and everybody should have this done. Like, I mean, I will just preach body work forever and always for every, you know, humans and horses, but 
it's a completely other, I guess, ego eradicating moment when you're working on your own horses. And so for me, then I, you know, I got to re- feel like, what does it feel like with good, healthy muscle tissue? And what does it feel, you know, when they're tense and when they're seized up? And so I would work on the horses and then we would work them. And then I could, I had that feel for, you know, all of the palpation that I'd done. And so I would feel them after the work and they would be seized back up again. And that was a huge ego eradicating moment for me because I was like, holy crap, you know, like they should feel better when we get done riding them. So if they feel worse when we get done riding them, something's not right. I mean, and I, and I wasn't like a, what I would say, I don't want to say like a bad trainer, but I wasn't, you know, I was very cognizant of the horses. I'm a very balanced rider. I have a lot of good training. I've worked with incredible people. Like there's nothing that really stood out even now, like looking back, it was just little bits and pieces of biomechanic knowledge that we don't really talk about. But it was so, it was so hard for me to, to see that and to feel that in the horse's bodies that I just kind of had a mental breakdown and I just trashed my whole training business. Um, and I just didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't continue to train horses and give lessons and watch other people do this to the horses and, and have a part in it if I didn't know how to make it better. And so I asked a lot of questions. I took a lot of lessons. I tried to find something I'd go to different clinics and I would feel the horses before and after we would get done and and the bodies still really weren't any better having been ridden and that didn't make sense to me like it should should be that way and I know like a lot of the classical literature talks about it so I just quit I quit riding and I quit training and I went to school for body work for the horses I dove head into it and then I went to a specialized education for um, body work for humans which is really where I got a lot of my knowledge for nerve release and the thoracic sling work and things like that. And slowly but surely after years of just working on the horses and feeling, you know, what, what their bodies do in different movements, what seems to help them playing with my own herd on like, I would release the body and then I would play with different movements and I would find what makes it better, what makes it worse. And then slowly kind of putting my trainer hat back on very, very, very slowly (laughs) through the years and carefully of how do we then integrate this into riding because we should be able to ride our horses and I love competing and I I love that whole aspect it's just trying to figure out how to do it in a correct balanced way so that the horses are better having been ridden versus worse so yeah that's kind of that's kind of how it all came to be yeah and I think there's obviously a lot to unpack in that story but something that you mentioned made me think of the next question of, you know, you talked about the thoracic sling and I've Mm -hmm. heard about that a lot recently. And I was wondering if you could kind of unpack, you know, what is that? And, you know, obviously this is a hoof care podcast. So how can it correlate to hoof issues? Totally. So the thoracic sling, I actually add a couple muscles to it in, in my experience. And we'll talk about that with the, the, um, hoof loading, but the main thing with the thoracic sling is it's a set of muscles that hold up the front end of the horse. So horses don't have collarbones. It's the only part of their body that's really not held up by a bony structure. So like their hind limb is, and they've got this beautiful skeletal structure, but then we go come up to the front end and there, there isn't any, there's nothing that holds it up. So part of the theory behind that is horses are grazing animals, right? And so their primary, they're, they're not really animals meant to be ridden. This is kind of our idea. And so part of the way that their general locomotion is designed is for them to peruse around the pastures grazing. So they've got a lot of open flexibility in their front end. Their neck is down, their head is down, and they can just kind of meander about through space with no strain or, you know, compression with the bones. So you take that and it it works really well for what they do in the wild. But then when we look at putting a quadruped into a riding situation, circles, you know, carrying a rider on its back, doing different things. What happens very quickly is that they don't use the front end of their body the way that we would necessarily say to use it for balance. And we don't really think about that. And so we don't train for that part of the body to be really developed. Now, what people have figured out is that if you do a lot of, you know, driving from behind, so to speak, you can somehow like so I used to ride motorcycles. So like, essentially to me, it's just like, okay, so you're having the horse do a wheelie. I mean, if you, if you really drive from behind and you pop the front end up, you can get a little bit more of that balance, but that's never, 
it's never really worked as a whole for soundness. It works to an extent for, you know, structure and for what it looks like to feel balanced. But over time, there's wear and tear on the limbs and the feet as a result. And so kind of playing around with, again, finding what muscles do what and why. You know, we I know some of the questions like you kind of talk about the crushed heels and front versus hinds and all, all of the different things kind of go into the different wear on how the horse wears on the feet. And this is kind of a, I'm, I'm, try, I'm going to try to make this as clear, clean as I can, but there's so many different threads as to why this happens. But I would say the main cause for issues in feet with the thoracic sling is inside of the thoracic sling, there's what's called a brachial plexus. And so it's this big fatty nerve bundle that has an array of nerves that branch out. So it comes out to the front of the chest, it goes down to the back of the body, up into the spine, down through the forelimb. And there's three primary nerves that run from that the, the brachial plexus down into the feet and innervate back up into the shoulder. So one of the main causes that I see with this is when there is a collapse of the thoracic sling, meaning it's not well developed. And I would say that that's probably the case in a minimum of 80% of horses that I work on. So it's really, really high. They do not have correct healthy nerve function from the brachial plexus down through the hoof and back up. So the reflex on how the hoof should land and how it communicates back up to the shoulder is not firing correctly. And so you can have the best farrier in the world that's doing the best balance job that they can possibly have. But if the nerve is not communicating, A, to the way that the foot is landing and at the breakover and how that whole reflex works from extension to flexion, and or how the nerve is communicating to the muscles up above to then pick the limb up, um, through the shoulder, it, it's not going to matter. And so the way that it loads from that is really, really crucial to kind of figure all of that out. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. And actually you mentioned something that I'm really passionate about, which is, you know, watching the horses move and watching how they're landing. And I know that you were talking about how that, you know, basically affects their, their landing and loading of their foot. And I didn't know if, mm-hmm. you know, is there a way that we can tell, I mean, this is probably a really hard question. It's but, totally okay. I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> is there a way that we can tell if they're, you know, if they're landing toe first or landing short strided, if that's coming from, like you said, something in the upper body, or if it's, you know, I typically am looking at it as, you know, is there hoof pain that's causing them not to want to fully extend that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. So it's definitely both. And, you know, I mentioned kind of before we got on this podcast, like I, by no stretch of the imagination, will I ever pretend to be a hoof expert? Like I just this year, I'm really diving down the hoof path, not, not to be an expert in it, but just because once I started really peeling back the layers of understanding the nerve function. And so I can fix a lot of, I shouldn't say fix. I can get a horse that comes in that has toe first landing without knowing anything about the hoof and depending on proper movement and activation of the sling and release of the nerves, I can get them heel first landing in one session. And this happens quite often. And then I would talk to some of my hoof expert friends and they're like, what the hell? Like, how are you doing that? Because this is, you know, it's a ton of work for hooves. Like it, you, you have to be able to fix it through the feet. And I'm like, well, I, I'm not touching the feet. I don't know anything about feet, but I can fix it through the shoulder and the sling apparatus and how all this is working. And so then we just kind of, I've honestly, I've just been really nerding out with them all year <laughs> and, um, and talking about how, how all of this correlates, but it's just, it's really fascinating. And obviously, you know, depending on the balance of the hoof itself and depending on if the horse has pain. So if the horse is in caudal failure, they're not going to want to land heel first, right? Like that's kind of a, okay, we got that. And how does, you know, if they have a good trim job and if things are happening, but horses are still continuously doing that, one of the things that they brought up is if the horse is in that stage and it, and it, it all comes down to chicken or the egg, I don't have a set answer for you. Like it's definitely chicken or the egg, but say you have a horse that comes in and they don't want to land heel first. And you look at the hoof and you're like, well, they're in caudal failure. Like, obviously they're not going to want to land on their hoof, but then you start trying to fix it. But then because of the way that their movement has gotten into like this compensatory issue, the way that they move and the way that their shoulders are muscled now will, they won't activate it naturally within their shoulder unless you kind of talk them into it. And so they're going to keep doing that. So then you guys being, you know, farriers are like on this uphill battle of 
okay, well, I can fix the hoof, but the way that they're using their body still isn't correct. And so the way that they're loading is causing this growth to be different. And it's just a whole loop. So yeah. it's both like you have to work with it. We're sitting down and looking at the anatomy of the shoulder and the hoof and the way that the nerves innervate. And the thing with the heel first or the toe first landing is the nerve for the flexor tendon runs from the back of the fetlock tendon down and around through the toe. And then the nerve for the extensor apparatus tucks down and around the hoof capsule. So it's really integral to the flexion and extension to the limb above it. And so that's where the nerves talk. And what makes this pretty cool is that the switching from extension into the breakover stage in a healthy nerve automatically trips on the flex reaction for the leg. So it's like a reflex, like when you get your knee tapped. So if the nerve has healthy function, which makes sense why I could pseudo fix it, so to speak, when I could get healthy function in the shoulder and, and or space through correct thoracic sling lift and movement, because then the nerve would fire correctly and they would be able to go down into that breakover and get that, the reflex. But it's also why it's detrimental because if you have a horse that lands toe first, it's not able to communicate anymore to that nerve. And the nerve innervates into a muscle. And so when you have horses that have significant hoof issues that have a toe first landing, they're not able to activate that, the nerve reaction. So that nerve is consistently not communicating to the shoulder, which then would atrophy the muscle. Does yeah. that kind of make sense? Yeah, definitely. And that's something that we're, you know, I put so much pressure on myself to get these horses landing and moving better. Um, and to have another piece of the puzzle is really amazing in my mind, you know, <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, I was super excited when we found that. I was like, oh my God, that makes perfect sense. Like, I totally get it now. Like, we know that it's like one and the other. And it's so cool to like actually be able to like sit there and look at it and be like, oh, I see. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. And actually, one of the first reasons or one of the reasons that I reached out to you is, you know, this idea of like heel crushing and and getting underrun heels or even just one heel that's crushing and the other one's really solid is, I mean, it can be like maddening as a hoof care professional when we're trying to work through these issues and we're doing, you know, all that we can and we start to get these complexes, you know, of, yeah, you know what are yeah. we doing wrong? And that's something that I was asking you is that, you know, I have a case where this horse will crush the medial heel and we've tried all different mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I would love your input on that. And obviously we know that some of it can be hoof care related. Some of it can be the, the approach sure. and the trim. But are there times when those crushed heels are coming from higher up, either in the hind end or the front or both? And maybe... Totally. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, no, totally. So especially like the medial heel one, that's one of the most common ones that I see translating from the shoulder. So if we go back and we think about the fact that horses are grazing animals and how their bodies are designed, they are also prey animals. And so... One of the main things, so if they don't have collarbone, they don't have a structure to kind of collapse and hold in all of their vital organs up in the front. So, I mean, their their nerve lines, their their arteries, their everything kind of runs in through that thoracic cavity. So I'll add in to the thoracic sling muscles. I add in the infraspinatus and the supraspinatus because they don't, so we don't talk about these muscles at all, but so the infraspinatus is really as we're kind of finding is the muscle of independent abduction. And then the supraspinatus kicks on to that and it's extension out of that abduction. So it only works when the infraspinatus is kicked on. And so we lose extension when we lose abduction. And, and so, and I'm sure you've seen it, but like when a predator goes to take down a horse, they generally go for either their flanks or their necks. And so you've got two sets of muscles there that collapse and pull the horse in. So you've got your brachiosphalicus muscle. So the low neck muscle seizes the whole neck up to kind of protect it from predator and it runs and attaches to the front of the humerus and so when it seizes up it collapses the shoulders in and so it kind of works if you imagine like a starting gate you know if a horse is free and open and the brachius phallicus is loose and the horse is just kind of going around and it's play drive and playing and using big fancy movements that starting gate is open and the minute they kind of kick on and they get they start feeling unsafe the starting gate closes and it seizes everything up what happens when that, and, and, and that's generally how they will move through space. So if we don't catch that, this is like the number one issue with thoracic slings. And this is how it translates to feet. So 
if we don't take into account that that's how the horse will naturally move its body, we don't isolate and separate it in how we train our horses. And so the number one thing that horses will struggle with in training, whether it's circles and, and turning into like a motorcycling horse that's leaning in really heavily or, you know, spinal integrity where they get kind of like, you know, spun up and they fishtail. There's so many different things that happen. And the root cause of it is that the horses lose the ability to abduct. So to draw the limb up and away from their body. So it's, it's really, really difficult. So then we see horses and I'm sure you've seen this when you watch horses walk, they like the number one chronic thing is tightrope walking. So horses will be walking and they cross one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And if they don't do it on the straight, they certainly will do it around a bend. So if you take a horse kind of loosely and you take it around a corner and they cross the outside limb in front of the inside limb, that's one of your biggest clue in that they don't have the correct musculature for abduction. It's not natural for them. And that's kind of like the, the, the golden egg of my training, I suppose, is that I've, I've learned how to isolate and activate those muscles and how to isolate and activate the muscles around the brachial plexus so I can prevent nerve impingement. When, when you don't do that and the horses want to get kind of stuck in this adduction, what happens is they, they have to, even just standing a little bit, and then when they're walking, their weight will be loaded immediately. They can't, they don't have the ability because they don't have the muscles musculature anymore to kind of come upright, let alone out laterally. Every once in a while, you'll see lateral ones. That one I don't see super common, but I do see quite a bit of medial ones. And that's, that's what it comes down to. And so my farrier and I will tag team on those cases a lot. And as soon as I can get those abductors fired on and balancing the horse out so that they can actually have full hoof stimulation throughout, instead of just being compressed to the inside, that goes away. But if he were to just do it on his own, he would just be, you know, ha- trying, 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 and nothing would happen because you can't change the way that the horse moves its body if it doesn't have the muscle to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. One of the things that happens with the high-low, because that's a big thing, right? Yeah. The number one thing that I've seen with high-low that I've been able to play with is I have started working a lot on foals and babies and kind of how that translates over. And there's a study, again, I can go back and send these to you, but there was a study in a veterinary journal a while ago, like it, it was it was a long time ago, so they might have even changed the statistics then. But even back then, they did a study where one in five foals had fractured ribs when they were born. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, which is really wild. So when I started working on foals, I had an idea that because I will see this natural asymmetry in horses pretty often. And every time I see a horse that has high-low, they also have significant asymmetry within the shoulders and the development of the shoulders. And so... You know, and, and again, like that comes down to like, is it chicken or the egg? Like, is the development because of the high low or is the high low, you know, in my opinion, I'm like, well, it's probably because of something that's going on in the shoulder. And so I'll treat the shoulder. And then as we go through the high low starts to go away, which is rad. Right. And so then I was like, okay, I'm going to get my hand on a lot of babies and find out because if it's a high low thing, it's, you know, there's a lot of theory around grazing patterns. And I'm like, okay, well, if it's a grazing pattern thing, it starts at it must start as a baby. And I bet it starts as like birth trauma with a shoulder. And so I went down that road and then I found that the veterinary journal study that talked about fractured ribs, and it's usually the the first few. And so I was like, well, that makes sense because if they came out and they had fractured ribs, they would want to protect that shoulder. And it was like by day three, you couldn't see any more. There was no more signs that the horse had fractured shoulders but they're prey animals, right? So they're designed to hide their imbalances. Right. So you have a foal that's born that has fractured ribs. It goes untreated. They start to protect that shoulder. Then they produce this like really wonky grazing pattern where one foot's always the base and one foot's always the one that's stretched out. And then you have high-low. Whereas if we started paying attention to that and we started treating the shoulder early on, and or the ribs to kind of help them expand that and get access to it again, we could eliminate that from foals going forward, which is really cool. So we've already been playing around with that. And even if we don't get to eliminate it during foals, being able to play with it and understand that, like I have, I have yet, see, I think we're looking at about 13 cases right now of high-low that's completely been able to go away through wow. correct shoulder. Yeah. So that's a really cool thing to play with. Yeah, definitely. And so you've been talking a lot about, you know, this nerve release and working on these nerves. And mm-hmm. can you 
Can you maybe say like what that entails? I know that you can't obviously teach somebody over a podcast how to do it. And that's not really what I'm asking. More like, (laughs) you know, what is, what does that look like? Like, what are you doing when you do that? So when I'm doing manual nerve release, it's kind of like if anybody's gotten, um, kind of, it's called structural integration massage therapy. So essentially what you're doing is you're going through and you're creating space. So one of the main things that happens with pinched nerves is it's not, it's not a problem with the nerve itself. It's a problem with the structures around it. So soft tissue around it, bony columns around it. Like, so people, if you're, you know, I'm a big believer in Cairo. And so a lot of the times my neck will need an adjustment. And if it goes out significantly, it will, the way that the vertebrae will misalign, it'll affect the nerve. And so I'll get a pinched nerve, quote unquote. And I'm sure like, there's a lot of people, I shouldn't say there's a lot of people. There's a lot of um, debate around whether or not to call it what it is. But for now, that's the vocabulary we have. So that's what we're using. But essentially the nerve gets it irritated because the bones are no longer in alignment the joints are not in alignment so the nerves that innervate between them are now annoyed and then you feel the sensation from that and so that happens through um, soft tissue issues as well so depending you know if it's the ligaments if the muscles are overseas there's there's all sorts of different things so what a manual session would look like is going down and and again, this is was translated over from my human school over to horses. I've just kind of played around with this over the years. But if you can go through and follow where the nerve lines go and create space for the nerves, be it by releasing the muscle tissue, by releasing the ligaments, by restoring joint mobility, you release the tension and the compression around the nerves and allow it to be eased. And it's pretty rad. Like you'll get immediate results. So like I'll have a horse that'll come and they'll just have an absolute concrete neck. Can't move it. You touch it. It's just a slab of, it just feels like a slab of concrete. And that's because the the nerves are so irritated that all of the muscles have seized up to protect it because if you ever had a pinched nerve, like it really, really sucks. And so then the body's secondary kind of response to that is I'm going to seize up and become completely immobile so that nothing could possibly ever annoy this again. (laughs) Right. Right. But then you're in a lot of pain because it's seized up. So you'll have this crazy concrete neck and within, you know, 15, 20 minutes of this gentle nerve release stuff, it'll just turn to jello and you have just immediate flexion and immediate mobility again. And it's, it's really rad. And so that's one of the cool things with that. And then in terms of how to protect it going forward. So my, my belief and kind of my methodology with how I train is, you know, muscles have actions, right? Like they do different things, but then they also do different things within the body. So there are muscles that are specifically designed to cushion and protect different joints. There's muscles that are designed to cushion and protect different structures of the body. And one of the main ones is the brachial plexus. And so there's a lot of muscles that I find typically are atrophied in horses and for spinatus being the biggest one. And when you look at cross sections of this muscle, the medial portion of the muscle runs inside the scapula and it serves to cushion. Not only does it serve as an abductor, but it serves to cushion between the scapula and the brachial plexus, as well as C6, C7, and T1. So, you know, I mean, that's a whole nother rabbit hole that we can go down. But if this muscle is atrophied, which in most horse cases, I see that it is because they don't require it really to be developed in the wild but they really require it to be developed, to be ridden, and we don't isolate it and talk about it. So when that muscle isn't developed correctly, we don't have a cushion anymore between that brachial plexus and the scapula. And so we can, we have consistent compression and consistent, you know, annoyance on that nerve. And then again, that directly translates into how it talks all the way down to the hoof, how it talks up the neck, like we'll get head shaking syndromes, it'll go away. Um, how it connects up into the wither, how it connects down the side, the vagus nerve runs through there. So now we've got behavior issues. We have gut issues. We have, you know, sleep deprivation issues. It's, there's so much that's governed by this one thing. Whereas, you know, it can do manual therapy and it helps. And I'll always, I mean, always, always, always like everybody should have body work done on the horses. And you know, there's a certain level to that where body work and balancing just through the body will always be a band-aid unless you have correct development to protect the structure from that happening again and to protect the way that the body is developing their muscles and firing on the nerves so that it communicate healthy to the feet. So, yeah. 
All right. Yeah. And as we were talking about, you know, doing all this stuff and that you're doing all the work that you're doing and how you're seeing these hard muscles just kind of like melt after going through a session. Do you ever see issues pop up that it's, I mean, I kind of think of like unraveling an onion, right? Like, okay, you took away this top okay. layer and then do yeah. you see like lameness come up that maybe was like held tight in because the muscles were so tight? Yeah, no, definitely. So one of the the main things that I'll say about this work is that I, so personally, I use, it, it's like the pillar. So personally, I use this work as probably more so diagnostically than I even do developmentally. Um, so I get a lot of undiagnosed lamenesses that'll come in and we'll play around with it. And basically what I do is I'll, we'll go through, you know, how the body is seized up. So when I do manual therapy, releasing the nerves, Again, I mean, it'll show you pretty right off the bat. So if they come in and they have an undiagnosed lameness because the nerve is so painful. So, I mean, some horses will be three-legged lame just because of a nerve impingement. And you get that cleared up and everything's fine. We've had other cases, like one of the most recent ones was we released the nerves. We restored functionality in the front end of the horse. And as we kind of restored functionality, we were able to slowly see that the compensatory patterns kind of pop up. And one of the things that came up was this horse. So they thought for the longest time that it was a right front issue. They're like, the horse is just on and again, off again, lame on the right front. And so, and I mean, they did everything. And for the record, this was a meter 20 jumper. So, I mean, like he did big stuff. <laughs> um, and he would just, every once in a while, he would just pop hot on that limb. And so we worked on him and he had the typical thoracic sling stuff and he had the typical like movement things and and so we restored all of that and then about three four months in all of a sudden he got lame on his left hind and it was really interesting and so the cool thing was that we were able to be like okay well like this is very clearly it's left hind and they ended up going in and getting some imaging of it and he had a torn meniscus and what was the other one there was another one but it was so old that it had been going on for a while. So, I mean, this horse was jumping with a busted meniscus, but had kind of ignored all of that and gone through so many compensatory patterns to make it happen that by the time it finally showed up in a way that people could see it, it was on the diagonal limb. So it was pretty trippy to see how that happened. But it was also really cool because we were able to strip away everything and get the horse into, you know, I like how you said, like the, the like functional anatomy movement. but once we were able to restore that, we were able to actually see what was going on that wasn't just a compensatory lameness, but it was an actual root cause. And so that's, I mean, like stuff like that's really rad to see. Yeah. And I feel like just thinking now about some horses that I work on and how I see a lot of, like you were saying, the diagonal type lameness, that's going to make me want to look more into those cases. And actually, because I'm thinking about that, I'm wondering, you know, are you, I don't know another way to ask this, but are you like the only person that does this in the United States or, you know, are there other, do you have like a network of people that you work with or do you travel? <laughs> I travel. Uh, I, I definitely travel and I, I've been training other people. So I do nerve release clinics. So I have people come with me to the nerve release clinics. I have people that come in and I clinic and teach them how to do at least the basic exercises. I mean, there's probably like, it, it's so... <laughs> I, I haven't really talked about this, but I'm going to with you because I think that you get it, but I'm going to bend just a little bit. It's really difficult because on one level, you're like, everybody needs to know about this. This should be in horse, like horse 101. Like you, you should be able to be like, this is a horse. This is how they naturally move through space. This is why they're not designed to be ridden. This is what we can do to help them be better. Let's talk about the nerves. Let's talk about the feet. Like this should be basic 101. Everybody should know this. And for some reason, it's not, and nobody does. And it's really cool. And I shouldn't say nobody, like there are people that are on very similar threads. And I, I talk to a lot of people who are like, Oh, yeah, we do the same thing. And I'm like, Oh, awesome. And I like, I'm a super play well with others. Like I love, love to work with other people about this stuff. But every single time I'll, I'll talk to them or, or we do stuff. It's like, they're close, but they're still not quite getting it. But they're still really, like, really onto like the classical dressage thing is usually a very common one. And while a lot of what I do is talked about in the classical dressage, they're missing a few key components, but people don't want to 
let go of this belief of, well, this master said this. And so I'm going to do this no matter what. And I'm like, that's neat. And they're, <laughs> even though they were master, they probably, maybe they weren't missing this, but this did not get translated in the text. So you're going to need to dial this down a little bit until you, you know, it's like, we have to break it down a little bit more than most people are doing. Like it's so slow, dude. Most of the stuff that we do is like very, very slow static. And then we do very, very slow through walking. And then we slowly teach the horse how to move again through space all the way up through patterns and cantering and jumping and whatever. But I say all this to say it's difficult because I want to, I want to teach this to the masses. And that's why, like I did, like the masterclass membership group is a really good way to start because you can kind of get in and get like the first few core exercises. And, you know, there's a lot of lecture of me explaining all the ins and outs so people can kind of take it and run with it. And at the same time, it's so easy for it to get like misconstrued because as with everything, and I know you see this in the hoof world because I know enough about feet to be very confused why it's so hard to find people that do balance trims. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's like there really are just a few th key things that you're wanting to look for here. And it's that people like to reinvent the wheel. And so you try to teach this and you try to explain stuff and then somebody like takes it and goes awry. And it's just I don't know. It's very, very difficult. And so I'm I am still very much in the learning process of trying to figure out how best to get this information out there in the hands of people in a way that's going to help them and not have it get kind of, cause when you're talking about nerves, like it's also really easy to injure a horse. Right. And so you want to be really careful about that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I'll get some lip for not being super transparent about different things. And I'm like, yeah, but like, I also don't want to be responsible for you hurting your horses either. So as a, as like a really long story short with all of this, it's as far as I know, there isn't anybody else that has figured out how to do it this way or at all. And so, and I hate, like, I hate saying that, like, I feel really gross saying that. And so, but, but there's not, and I wish that there was, but there's not. And so my only kickback on that is that I'm trying really, really, really hard to train other people. I'll do distance sessions, but I can only do so many distance sessions, you know, and I've got a family and a ranch and my own horses that I like to play with. And so trying to train up other people to do this work has turned into more of my passion. And trying to turn this brand into like, here is something that you guys can learn how to do an apprentice with me. We're going to really try to get this dialed in. And then you guys can go all off and teach it so that it does become common knowledge. I'm working on a lot of works um, like with vets. So, so I, I work primarily with vets, which is really cool because this stuff, again, it's not taught as in, in their school. It's not part of their differential diagnosis. And so, you know, they go out and they all they see is how to do like joint stuff or injections and it works to an extent, but there's so many of them that get burnt out because they're like, oh my God, like there's, there's gotta be something more to this. And this is only a band aid, and it wears on them too. And so being able to sit down with vets and educate them on, on the muscles and the way that they fire and how to do these exercises to kind of help restore the horse and prevent this stuff has been a game changer for them because then they don't have to feel like they're just chasing their tails around things. And it's just, it's, it's such cool it's such cool work. I just, I'm trying to teach more people how to, how to do it. Yeah. And so if somebody's really interested either just to learn on their own or to actually be able to do this for other people, do you have a way that they can connect with you? The best ways to do this is, like I said, the best way, and it's super, I mean, it's super cheap. It's 150 bucks and you can get into, it's a group of like 1200 people. So you have a lot of like-minded people that are on the same path, which is also really cool. But there's, God anymore. There's just probably over 10 hours of lecture, probably more. Lots of pictures, lots of different educational information, lots of information about the hooves, lots of information about how to balance the body, how to kind of turn this work into a checklist. And so like, that's the best way for people to at least like self start and kind of get their toes wet in it. And then between me and the handful of other trainers that I've worked with, we're all available for distance sessions, which is really cool. And so I've seen just insane success doing these lessons via zoom. Like it's not really difficult. I had a really big block around it for a long time. And, um, I started it, I just had my baby in March. And so I was like, well, I can't travel. So I'm going to have to like push through this mental block and figure it out. And it's just as dude, it's just as good giving lessons via zoom as it is in person. It's totally fine. And so we've been, we've been doing that and that's been really helpful. So sessions with us look something like 
you kind of let us know what's going on with the horse. We ask for a very specific set of photos and videos so we can kind of mark them up and analyze what's going on within the body and then come up with a basic plan kind of around the pillars of the work to isolate and activate whatever muscles that the horse needs to find a balance and kind of go from there. And, it, and it's meant to be really broken down in a way that after just a few sessions, you don't necessarily need anything with us anymore. So this isn't one of those like... I'm not big on people having to like stay asking questions for whenever, like I want it to be and not, I mean, it is, it's, it's easy enough that just your basic amateur owner can come in and be like, I got this. I've had three lessons. I've figured out how to turn this into a checklist. And then they kind of go back out into the world and compete and have fun. And the horses are sound. And if something pops up, they kind of have a checklist of what to go through that they can find on their own. And it's really validating for a lot of owners, which is also really cool because they'll be like, oh, I really felt that something was off with my horse for a long time, but I couldn't figure it out. And then now they have like a checklist to play with, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so that's, that's the best way currently. And then, and we all, I shouldn't say we all, there's four of us that will travel and do clinics right now and I'm working on doing more. And so that's also a thing that we'll do. And really, I'm just, like I said, I'm, I'm just super passionate about teaching other people. So yeah. It's funny because it seems really overwhelming in the beginning because it's just this onslaught of information. And and then after a very short amount of time, it's just super easy. And you're going to be able to whip it out like nobody's business. It'll be really cool. You'll walk up and you'll be like, oh, this is what you do. Just like 5, 10, 15 minutes a day. Everything's good to go. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I would love to be able to do that just because... Like you said, I feel like sometimes I hit these roadblocks where I'm like, okay, I'm doing all that I know how to do to fix this horse. Yeah. And I'm not seeing the progress I want. So that'd be really cool. No, you can't. And I mean, it's the same for like, for saddle fitters too. Like, my God, I feel so bad for them because they go out and they have these people that, I mean, and they're throwing just tens of thousands of dollars at them. And they're like, I just want the perfect saddle to fix my horse. And they're like, that's neat. Your horse has no trapezius. Like I, I, saddles, saddles are actually in fact made to fit a horse that is moderately developed to be ridden and your horse is not, or they have a completely collapsed thoracic sling to the point that like they're mutton withered. And there's so many things about, you know, just as another slight tangent, like what we look at a horse as confirmation, that's not true. Like most of it's posture. There's some, I'll send you, there's one photo of a horse. One of the things that I learned, and, and I've, I've, I've known this for a few years, but we had a case over this, this winter where I have now learned that horses that are like pretty significantly post-legged in the, in the hinds, which totally affects their, their feet and their heels is in fact, not actually confirmational. <laughs> You've been able to um, correct it completely unwound it multiple times there was one that was like really severe and and it was the first one that I watched it really unwind and I was like holy and so then we started playing with these exercises with these other horses because I hadn't really honed in on that because I thought it was confirmation and I was like you know at this point I should just start assuming everything's posture and not confirmation and seeing what we can change but yeah they were just they were so tied up in their psoas that they ended up getting a pelvic tilt that caused their entire hind end to appear post like And so they moved that way. They acted that way. It was just, I mean, same for us, right? Like we can establish a posture, you know, those that like sit over a computer desk all the time, like their posture affects their movement, affects their mood, affects, you know, the health and wellness of their joints and mobility. And it's the same for the horses. And so by unwinding the psoas, and then after we activated the, so when horses have a collapsed thoracic sling, it goes down and again, they don't have any bony structure in the front. So then the only ways that they can hold the front end of their body up are by their neck. So they have a lot of low neck hypertrophy and wear and tear on their pole and, or they hold themselves up with their psoas and their hind end. So you've got a, a ton of compression where everything just basically like is doing this break over to try to hold up this collapsed front end. So when you, and everybody's like, you only focus on the thoracic sling. And it's like, I do. Yes. And it's still a whole horse thing because the reason why I primarily focus on the sling is because when you can restore healthy nerve function, you restore healthy movement. So that, and that really starts up in the, in the brachial plexus, in my opinion. And when you can restore the development of the front end of the horse, what happens is you, as it strengthens, it, takes away all of the loading 
on both the neck and the hind limb, which then expands the body into kind of having a normal function. So when we did that with the fir- this first horse that was severely post-legged, what happened is the way that the loading was on the psoas from holding up the front of the horse went away and the hind limb was able to actually expand. And then she was able to also activate her, her true core and her abductors in her hind end. And then all of that went away and she has a beautiful like hip to stifle angle. Like it's gorgeous. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> we can change that. That's so cool. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, this is all like super fascinating. And I feel like I could ask you a million questions and talk to you forever. Um, which, you know, I would love to continue learning and I can't wait to, to take a peek at your group and everything like that. Um, but I, you know, I have to get going, but, um, Thank you so much for being willing to do this. This has been super interesting. And I already have some horses that I'm thinking of that could really, really benefit from this. And I'm sure that listeners have a bunch that they'd love to help out too. So um, I'm really excited to get this information out there so that, that, you know, others are hearing about it that might not already know who you are. No, totally. (laughs) Awesome. All right, cool. Well, thank you again. It was really great to chat with you today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let me know um, whenever you get pictures and stuff or however I can help you along the way. I'd be happy to. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, And I hope you have a great rest of your week. You too. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.